the, the session today is basically uh, trying to explain a bit why we create a monitor, why we are trying to document this data, but also specifically how CV space restrictions do not affect every group in the same manner and how we're collecting data, but more importantly, how we can improve the data that we're collecting, but also how we are presenting this data. So as you can see from the agenda, and I think it's not going to go exactly as planned because I think we have at least 30 minutes uh, less. We divided the session into two main groups. The first one, presentation, and I have uh, here with me my colleagues from Civicus. I have uh, Deborah Leao, who is a civic space researcher for the Americas, uh, Arti Nes, who is civic space researcher for Europe and Central Asia, and Goitsi Kwada, who is a researcher uh, with us who uh, try to kind of collect all of the main messages and takeaways from this session. So first we will start with a very brief presentation of why we create a monitor, how we collect the data, and then we move off of what is that data telling us how civil space restrictions look like today at a global level. And then we kind of dive in a little bit more on how these restrictions affect differently uh, particular groups. The second part of the session is a bit more interactive. We're going to try to explain how we collect that data now and give you feedback on how we might improve, and also give you a little bit of an, an overview of how we are planning. We're in the process of implementing a new system to gather and disaggregate data. So we will show you a bit very briefly what we're we thinking about, and then you can also give us feedback on how that tool might be useful for you, maybe more useful than how we present the data now, and what else can CVCUS do uh, to improve these data collections. Um, I will hand over to Deborah now, who will start uh, the presentation about how uh, we collect this data. Then over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deborah. Mariana, we can see the presenter view. I don't know if there's a way to just show the slideshow because with the presenter view, it's quite hard to read. Um, so maybe you can change the display. Thank you. So I'll start by thanking you all for your patience and for joining us today despite the issues. As Mariana said, I am Deborah. I have been working with the biggest monitor for three years now. And my main work is the lead research on the Americas. But today, uh, I'll just be introducing our work, um, just to level out the understanding of what we're talking about for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Civicus Monitor. Please do let me know if you have any issues with the audio. I have a bit of a sore throat today as well. So apologies if my voice fails at some point. Um, so the Civicus Monitor, to put it very briefly, um, what it is is a research collaboration and also an online tool uh, tracking the conditions of civil society in 196 countries. So if you were to access our online tool or our website, um, you'd see a world map, a very colorful one, showing um, the different ratings categories um, that represent the conditions of civic space in each country, going from open, where it is less respected, to close, where civic space conditions are very difficult. Um, so what are we talking about exactly when we talk about civic space? Uh, we weren't sure whether everyone here would be familiar with the concept. So civic space, uh, Maria, I think I also knew one. Um, civic space is, uh, to put it simply, the ability of people to organize, to take action, to demand change, speak out, right? Uh, more formally, we're talking about civil, civil and political rights, in particular, the respect for freedom of assembly, association, freedom of expression, all of these underpinned by the state's duty to protect. Um, I had a video to show, but I think considering the kind of time constraints, I can just go through a little bit of what was on the video and maybe we'll put in the link if you'd like to see it later. Um, or are we going to play it? <laughs> uh, 
yeah, no, let's let's just go with what was in the video. Essentially, what we were trying to show with the video is just why the civics monitor, right? Why are we monitoring this? And it mainly it is to shed light on the restrictions faced by civil society. Um, it is a tool to make sure that um, organizations, activists, media, decision makers have reliable and up-to-date information on the conditions for civil society so that we can take concerted, um, strong action to demand um, an opening of civic space and to also challenge the restrictions. So it is very much about forcing governments mainly, but also other actors to um, uphold their human rights commitments domestically and internationally. And on the other hand, it is also a recognition that Conditions for civil society are often very volatile, right? Uh, protest movements grow overnight, and sometimes the crackdown on these protest movements is very quick. Um, there's also changes when, let's say, government changes or condition changes. So it's a very dynamic um, kind of area that we're working on. But at the same time, at the international level, the information is often months, if not years, out outdated. You know, it takes um, some time between the what's happening on the ground and what gets reported by international groups or international organizations. And so we believe that there's a need for something that is more dynamic, a tool like the monitor that is able to give you more frequent updates, is able to point out quickly deteriorating situations, and is still a reliable database that um, so society can use to advocate for better conditions, uh, we've seen media referring to our data as well to show um, the conditions of civic space. And we've seen governments also referring to it at the international level and also at the national level, even in parliament. Um, so these are some of the reasons why we're doing this work. Um, after my presentation, I think RC will go a bit into the findings of this work and into the ratings. But for now, um, I will say that we do work with 20 on uh, research partners. These are often regional organizations that have their own local and national partners. They feed us or provide us with information, um, which we call civic space updates. So again, if you were to look at our um, website, you could go into the explore session section and you'd see um, updates that cover the past couple of months. Um, you're able to filter these by country, you're able to filter them by rating category region um, tags principally. And so what are these exactly? So one part of our work, as I said, is rating, the other part is the analysis of what um, types of restrictions, what types of developments are affecting civic space, and who is being affected. So I got here an example from Colombia, which is a country I cover. Um, Marianne, if you can. Um, so here we have, for instance, a very simple example, a journalist um, who was leaving her work and was followed by a funeral car for several kilometers. The police was able to intervene um, and the driver said that they'd been hired to follow her car um, and that they were picking up a dead body. So this was information given to us by a research partner. We then verify it, sometimes triangulate it with other sources. Um, and once we do have that information, we're able to um, essentially what we say is tag, tag it. So in this case, we, we tag um, intimidation because it is a, a, an instance of intimidation. We'd also tag women because it is a woman journalist who was affected. Um, and in this way, we're able to analyze um, what sorts of violations, restrictions, positive developments are affecting civic space worldwide and what sorts of um, actors are involved in these, both positively um, and negatively, or perpetrators and, and um, persons affected. So just to make it clear, at the moment with this type of system, we're able to download, let's say at the end of the year, hundreds of these updates, which give us the direction, so the trend, let's say, of what sorts of uh, restrictions are most common, what groups are most often affected. 
And we are now in the development of being able to track more specifically incidents. So you might be familiar with other organizations works like um, let's say Global Witness says there were a certain number of human rights offenders killed each year. So this is not the type of work we're doing. We're doing more on the trend side. And we're able to look at um, the different regions and the different groups affected um, in terms of trends. So I will let um, Artie come in now with the findings that we've had in the past few years. And thank you. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put it in the chat. I'll put the link to the video that we had in the chat as well. Thank you so much, Deb, for that overview of the Civicus Monitor. Uh, before Artie comes in with uh, the most target uh, groups or the groups who have been more commonly involved in civil space violations, I thought I would give you a bit of a, a very general overview of what type of analysis are we doing. So uh, just full disclosure, I don't, I'm not able to see much the chat or anything because I'm afraid that we will mess up soon. So yeah, please speak up if uh, there is any issue. Uh, so basically we create the monitor uh, almost six years ago now. And the idea as Deborah explained is, is actually build a resource collaboration. So this is not just Civicus work, as everything that Civicus does is in our DNA, it is a collaboration with our members and partners. So they are the one who send that information to us and we're able to do two things, the ratings, which is the colors that you can see and that shows whether or not a state is protecting and respecting human rights. So as you see the green means that there is open city space. So people are generally able to go to the street and process to associate, to exercise work as a human rights defender and to speak out without having major consequences. And from there, you have narrow, obstructed, repressive clothes, which in the case, uh, uh, the lack of respect and protection for this use freedom in each of these uh, components. So apart from that, we are also able to analyze all of this qualitative information to give you an example, at the end of the year from uh, November to November of the following year, we might have around 500 reports that have been sent by our research partners covering uh, the main five regions where we disaggregate over that. All of those 500 plus reports, we kind of disaggregate the data to be able to say, what are the main violations? Step back a little bit. This is basically how the work looks like uh, today. Uh, how many people now uh, live in countries who seriously, significantly restrict civil space restriction, as you can see, is the majority and very few, only 3% of the world population actually live in countries where civil space is actually being respected. Uh, last year, uh, we saw uh, an important deterioration of city space in a few countries, as you can see uh, from the spring, uh, Nicaragua and Haiti in the Americans, uh, a few countries uh, in Africa also went from obstructed to repressive space or from narrow to obstructed uh, like South Africa, Europe, continue uh, this path of deterioration with countries like Poland joining the obstructed category or Belgium and Czech Republic leaving once they were an open uh, category of civil space because the violations in these countries continue to increase. I'm not going to go into the details of each one of them. I'm going to move forward with what and we do with all of these reports that we kind of analyze the data. So from all of that, we are able to tell very broadly what are the main violations that we have documented over the past year. So as you can see from the screen, the detention of protesters was the number one 
violation that we record in 20 uh, uh, last year, meaning that the states actually use this tactic more frequently at a global level. There are some uh, regional difference uh, in order to kind of deter or prevent people from going to the street and protest, likely because actually protests are one of the tactics that work the most to actually impart some change. Uh, we also have intimidation in the past of street legislation as one of the most common violations. It is important to remember the context of uh, how we're saying this. Uh, we are about to be within three years on uh, the pandemic, and this context have allowed some states to use the pandemic as an excuse to further restrict rights. So first, because uh, COVID-19 restrictions, they claim that people cannot go out and protest, therefore, they often uh, detain them. And second, they have passed mostly restrictive legislation or legislation that does not comply with international law, whether it is through an emergency decrease or through parliament that affects civil freedoms. And one of the type of legislation that we have seen being passed is a legislation aimed to tackle uh, the same formation, but what we have seen more often is that it's overly broad and basically being used to just shut down criticism or censor people who wants to speak out. We also have seen a dry spot, not everything uh, is, is bad news over the past few years. We also have seen how successful protests uh, has been in part in change uh, from Malawi who has to rerun elections to what it calls the green tide in Latin America, where women's reproductive rights uh, have been uh, achieved successful victories through the act of uh, taking to the street and protest. But we also have seen how litigation actually have worked and many courts have handed down a positive court judgments that basically just open up a city space or compete in, in the perpetrators or certain city space restrictions, which we think is a step forward to, to, to prevent impunity. This is basically, in a nutshell, a few of the findings that we found and in People Power on the Attack, our annual report, and I will hand over now to Art if he will explain a bit more how a particular groups are more targeted than other. Art, over to you. Thank you so much to Mariana and Debra for um, contextualizing the, the work that we do and giving the audience a sense of how we collect data. So I'll be touching on how civic space restrictions affect already excluded groups differently. Um, and as you can see on the screen, there are pictures displayed from various protest movements led by women across the world, from Latin America to Afghanistan, um, to Pakistan and Poland, where we are seeing that women are taking to the streets. Um, but to frame this discussion, um, I'd like us to think about um, how we can think intersectionally um, to fill the gaps and to also make sense of how civic space restrictions are experienced by excluded groups and how they're affected because of multiple systems of oppressions. What I mean by that is that not every group experiences restrictions in the same way. So for example, as I mentioned, we've been documenting women's rights defenders, um, women journalists who are continue to feature frequently in Civicus Monitor updates. But these women are, women are targeted by violations and they often do not experience violations in the same way. What I mean is that often violations um, experienced by women human rights defenders and women journalists are gendered in nature. So before I explain what I mean by gendered in nature with a few examples, um, I'd just like to give a trigger warning for some of the examples may be um, may, may be sensitive for the audience. So one of the examples is in Egypt, for example, a freelance journalist, Salafa Mahdi, who was detained as a result of her reporting, and she was physically and sexually assaulted in police custody. In a country like Malaysia, we saw an environmental rights defender um, being threatened over WhatsApp with sexually explicit messages um, containing an indecent poster of her, as well as the leaking of her personal information in that particular message. 
Um, and the use of doxing in particular, that is the releasing of people's personal information online, is something that we are seeing in some regions happening to women's rights activists as well as journalists. And then we are also documenting intimidation and harassment tactics against women human rights defenders and journalists in countries, for example, like Lebanon, to Serbia, to Poland. And this intimidation and harassment tactics are gendered in nature, meaning these women human rights defenders and these journalists are not simply being attacked for the work they are doing, but often the attacks are accompanied by threats of sexual violence. Um, comments on their body um, and labeling and smear campaigns. For example, one um, journalist being labeled a prostitute in Slovenia by the then prime minister. So it goes beyond just um, death threats. It often features um, threats which are sexual in nature and directly threaten um, either the woman's sexuality or her gender. But as Mariana mentioned, you know, there are very many bright spots that we've been documenting. So as you can see, many protests taking place uh, where women are taking to the street to claim their rights. So for example, in Poland and in other parts of Latin America, we've seen women taking to the streets to fight for reproductive justice. And then in countries, for example, like South Africa, like Turkey and Pakistan, we see that women have been fighting against gender-based violence and femicide. And in other countries such as Sudan and Senegal, we are seeing how women and feminists are calling for the implementation of key conventions and mechanisms that will help in addressing gender-based violence. And as you can see pictured there from Afghanistan, where women are currently taking to the street, fighting for education and the right to work um, since the Taliban rule has significantly constrained their rights. But we are also documenting other groups um, who are being affected by civic space restrictions, such as environmental rights groups. And here again, we need to think in intersectionally. So environmental rights groups could be made up of Afro-Indigenous communities. Um, women could also be environmental uh, defenders as well. LGBTI persons could also be part of this group. So it's not a homogenous group. It's made up of various different um, heterogeneous components. Um, in Latin America, for example, we're seeing um, a wide range of criminal charges being used to retaliate against leaders of communities and movements who are resisting environmentally damaging products, um, projects. Sorry. In Uganda, we're seeing that um, land rights defenders are taking on international agribusiness projects, and yet they are being threatened with charges of um, threatening violence against the, the guards who own a particular plantation. In Cambodia, we're seeing the criminalization of activists becoming widespread, where authorities are bringing charges of incitement, plotting, and conspiracy against environmental and land defenders. In other parts, and very well known and documented, we're seeing like in Finland, Germany, and the UK, where young climate activists, um, part of groups such as Extinction Rebellion, as well as uh, the Fridays for Future climate strikes are facing repressions when they protest. And once again, it's important to recognize that while restrictions are being documented, there are also tremendous achievements and results being documented amongst environmental rights groups, such as them getting governments to commit to take action um, and at all levels, national, regional, and international. We're also seeing um, labor rights groups being um, involved in civic space incidences, particularly this has been in the spotlight during the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, where we saw healthcare workers um, staging socially distanced protests um, to highlight the, the plight of their working conditions, the lack of PPP, PPE equipment. Um, we've also seen how informal sectors and small businesses as well um, stage protest call on the government to provide support for their livelihoods, which were um, significantly threatened during the pandemic. Um, we are also seeing LGBTQI plus rights groups um, in various forms of protest. Um, in one, on the one hand, we're seeing in some countries where restrictive legislation is being passed, for example, in Hungary, and then in Poland, we're seeing LGBTQI rights defenders being targeted by strategic litigation against public participation. Um, in countries like Ghana, we're seeing that um, centers that exist to um, assist the LGBTI community are being raided and closed down. 
while in China we're seeing prominent LGBTI rights groups being targeted in a very oppressive context. And lastly, we've also been documented quite a few cases uh, involving youth. The involvement of youth is quite diverse. Um, prominently, they've been um, taken to the streets, as we all know, to tackle the climate crisis um, in environmental rights protests. But we're also seeing in some countries like Turkey, Greece, Hungary, and Serbia, where youth are taking to the streets to demand academic freedom. In Palestine, we saw most recently during the Sheikh Jarrah uprising that the youth are playing a significant role in fighting against the Israeli occupation. And then in Tunisia, we're seeing young people really taking to the streets to fight against the authoritarian regime and the government. Aside from the examples that I've mentioned, uh, the Civicus Monitor, as my colleague Deb explained, um, we use a tagging system and we also feature other um, groups that are covered through tags, so refugees and migrants, people with disabilities, minority groups, indigenous groups, and religious groups. And these are just some of the other tags that we use, um, which would fall under the excluded groups category. Um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, I think it's important for us to think about these groups intersectionally and to think about how we can use an intersectional framework or lens to fill the gaps in terms of the types of restrictions we're documenting, but also thinking about how different groups experience restrictions in different ways um, because of the gender identity, because of race, because of sexuality, et cetera. Um, I'm going to pause there for now and hand it over to Mariana. Thank you so much, Arti, for uh, those highlights. Uh, you know, give us context to uh, the second part of the session, sharing the agenda again, so we can have a visual of where we're going next. So we plan for uh, a little bit more time to do this interactive session. We wanted to kind of get to know who is in the room. Are you? collecting uh, data or what type of work you do. So please feel free to uh, uh, write on the chat uh, what type of work uh, you do, are you doing data collection, et cetera, because I don't think we will have time to do the polling exercise uh, that we have planned. We are trying to stick still to the schedule and probably uh, end close to 12 uh, as, uh, as we plan. So we, we are trying to just move forward a little bit quicker. Uh, so I will skip this. Uh, so I'm going to go back a bit into what are we able, what stories are we able to tell when we collect the data? As we have mentioned throughout these presentations, uh, every report that comes to us via our research partners, the Civicus team uh, disaggregate that data. Basically, every time we have a report, we do like a tagging system. And what is on the screen now is the type of data that we're able to uh, present, right? We can see on the top left, uh, what are the top violations at a global level. So in the 197 countries and territories that we cover and document how states and non-state actors are trying to restrict and limit TV space. But we also can do this by region. So you can see Middle East and North Africa, Asia Pacific, the America, we have Europe and Central Asia and Africa as well how that is different, right? You can see that the detention of activists is very prominent, for example, in the Middle East in North Africa, as well as censorship, but intimidation and the detention of protests is a tactic most commonly used in the Americas, as in Asia, a restricted the passing of restricted legislation or the use of restricted legislation against activists and the detention of human rights defenders who sometimes go hand in hand is one of the most common tactics we use. And how our research partners gather this information? Ideally, as they are regional organizations, 
uh, they gather that data from their own national organizations. And in 2016, when we create the monitor, I don't know how well you can read, but this, all of this information is in our website. We develop a set, the research framework, a set of guiding questions uh, for our research partners to sort of respond or address every time they submit a report, which uh, they have been doing every two months since 2016. So you can see the three main fields that we cover, expression, association, and peaceful assembly, and the type of questions that they usually respond in uh, those reports. So basically when they log in to the site, they will say, for example, in the past two months, are any group has been experienced delayed on registration or in the past two months have any groups or activists taken to the street? And if so, how, was that protest restricted? The policies of four were some groups more commonly targeted than one. So this is the type of information that we receive uh, on a daily basis. Once we receive this information, we create what we call a tagging system. So researchers, RT, Deborah, and every regional researcher in our team will read the report and then basically say is there has been an attack on human rights defenders, they will just tag attack on human rights defenders. And all of this information you can actually disaggregate as they were explained in the explore session of our site. The list is longer. We have you know, off the top of my head, I would say around 56 tags uh, of this nature, basically just the type of violation or positive development or a neutral tag uh, that kind of explain uh, basically uh, what has happened. Once we have all of this data every year or every month or every time we want to do a thematic report, we basically just count that. You can see this list on the left, for example, that there were more than 200 incidents of protesters being detained over the past year based on the data that we got. And this is at a global level, and there were more than 300 incidents of protests happening over the past year. And from that, as you can see on the right side of the screen, we kind of tell you uh, what has been the main violation that we have a uh, record over the year. Uh, but we also, as Artie explained a bit, able to say what are the groups that are most commonly involved in civil space incidents. I think Artie already explained uh, a bit how it is work and provide some examples of how certain groups are specifically that. Again, this vary uh, in every region. This is at a global level. The five main groups who are most commonly involved in civil space incidents. But this is where we want to stop and kind of gather the feedback. So I think I will have to pause my screen sharing or if someone can share the jam board for me on the chat. So we can start dialing feedback. Let me see if I can do it just a few. Give me a few seconds, please. Hi, everyone. I just shared the jam board link. So please be with access. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deb. So the jam board uh, is there. Uh, this is now I'm speaking by memory here because I don't have it in front of me. Uh, but if you are presented, this is the graphic that we share on people power on their attack. So if you are reading the report, eventually on page 15, you will see this graphic saying, hey, civil space violations, these are the group who are most commonly involved. Are you able to tell exactly what we are trying to say here. So if this presentation clearly uh, and easily understandable, and if not, what is missing when you see this graphic? So you go to the Jamboard, the number one slide, you can gather a sticky notes and kind of write a little bit 
what is this data telling you as a reader, as the audience? Is there something missing? So I will give you a, a few minutes, a, around three minutes to, or a couple of minutes to respond that way. So I think I have managed to share my screen. I have seen a few people online. And this is the first question. When you see the graphic that I just showed, what that information is telling you, what else would you like to know? So basically, you can just grab a sticky note and write um, anything that might come to mind as a feedback. All right, we have a couple of good feedback. Uh, basically, how we can further disaggregate our data uh, in the intersection, which is a good point, uh, of uh, those groups. Now, I'm going to try to share my screen again to present you with more information. So maybe we take you back to a, what Arti was explaining a bit of you know, a few of the examples that she gave. That is a type of information that we give as narrative qualitative information after this graphic is presented on people's time. Let me check.
Are you able to see my presentation again? Yeah. Yeah, I think this has turned out to be tricky that usually you see Zoom. So here, if we give you this information, right? After you see the graphic, you can see exactly how groups are more frequently and to what extent. We give you a few examples of how, a, for example, in this case, woman human right defender has been targeted and why. And also, despite these restrictions, we also have seen women being at the front line of opening a civil space. And then, a line of what other groups are most commonly involved in violation. So, if you see this information in addition to the graphic, then again, Will this be useful for your work? So as you go to a slide number two on the jam board, if after the graphic we provide more information and specific examples to illustrate, is there any additional information from what you are seeing on the screen that will be also useful for the work that you do, the advocacy work or research work that you're covering? So just again, a couple of, of minutes to respond. Uh, the second question, I will search um, that screen again. All right, thank you so much for that very beautiful feedback. I'm going to, again, share my screen. I have the presentation on, I think. And we are going to go on to the second part of over there. So as you see, we somehow managed to gather some data that kind of tell us useful insights as to what type of violations are occurring and to what extent these violations or which groups are most commonly involved in this violation, which is, to be honest, a little bit also vague in terms of kind of assessing what that actually means commonly involved, it is violation, it is a positive development. In this case, it's both. So how we can tell, apart from the qualitative information that we provide, how uh, this is happening. So we have developed what we call an NCM form, which basically every time that a report comes to us, we try to disaggregate that data further. So instead of just tagging restricted legislation, protesters being detained, we go by and actually say 
who was the perpetrator. And we do this by uh, each of the incidents or each of the cases that we have and not just the whole report. But we also are able to tell uh, in more detail uh, how many of these violations are actually taking place. Uh, we're able to also disaggregate the data in what is the work of the groups or the activists or the human rights defenders when that person was attacked uh, or what type of protest uh, was met with excessive force, uh, who is more likely to be target of this. Uh, so we did a very uh, brief uh, analysis of that data just to show you we haven't actually ever present that, this data to the public. So we basically just took the data that we have from March of last year and able to kind of show you what type of information uh, we and you will be able to, to use uh, for next year forward uh, when we start implementing this system. So as you can see here, next year in people power on the attack or the year after, uh, you are going to be able to see and use information like, yes, these are the top violations, but who actually was the perpetrator? So as you can see here, the majority, at least very uh, a, a small sample, March 2021, the state uh, was uh, the most common perpetrator when it comes to civil space violations. And you can see also political parties, or we don't know, which is also some, sometimes the case, or corporations. So you are able to actually see a bit more uh, who is doing what, and we will be able to actually segregate also this data by region. We're also going to be able to see who is more commonly targeted, right? Are there human rights defenders, or is the media and the journalists, or is pro are protesters the one who are usually most commonly affected by these restrictions? As you can see here, again, for a very small sample, media outlets or journalists are uh, groups that uh, usually experience uh, civil space restrictions the most, or at least that what happened in March 2021. We're also going to be able to see what is the type of work that a journalist, a human rights defender, or an activist is doing to be the target by the state, by a corporation, by any other non-state actor of these restrictions. And as you can see here, it varies, but it's basically just human rights, most commonly social justice, working for democracy, advocacy, or civic participation, etc. And many others that we have that are disaggregated, but these are the top ones. And like this, we will be able to disaggregate the data a, a bit more from next year a, forward. I'm going to then share again my screen here. And after seeing this type of the, the disaggregation of data, who is the perpetrator? Who is, are the main target groups? Uh, what type of work are they doing? We're also going to be able to see if a protest was, and I think I saw that question at the beginning. When people take to the street and protest, there is usually a police presence. It's, it's part of the state duty to protect. Uh, how the police act, so we were able to say if, People were actually able to gather and protest, even with police presence without major issues, or the police actually use excessive force or other tactics to restrict civil space. So we will be able to tell when a protest became violent. And if so, it was because of the acts of the police or any or their authority, or because of the acts of a small group of people within the protest, or how that happened. We will want to, to, to tell a, a bit more of, of how these violations are occurring. So the third question we have is how will this type of information will be useful for your work? It is what we already presented, already useful, how this detailed information that we can disaggregate by groups, even by regions or sub-regions, how can you use this information on daily work? 
as an advocacy or as a researcher. And the last question, I can see people already are responding. If there is anything else that Civicus should consider in collecting relevant evidence about the effects of civic space restrictions on excluded group. This is one of the most important questions that we have when we create and monitor. The idea behind is to create a tool for civil society and other stakeholders to use to perform advocacy effectively or for their research. So what else can we do as the topic of this session is focusing on discrimination to, to be able to tell better the story of those groups who are affected differently by the civil space restrictions. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, so I will give, uh, leave the jam board open and then we can just uh, wrap up the session. Thank you. All right, I think very, very uh, useful comments on the jam board about intersection of different groups, but also intersection between civil space and economic studies, and other type of research that uh, we should, that we might think about doing uh, in our research. So what uh, this is time for us to wrap up. Uh, I just wanted to give you kind of like an overview of what's next. The idea of this session is obviously to be uh, interactive and to have concrete recommendations to move forward. Uh, we are in the middle of implementing this new uh, documentation system. So the idea today was just to gather a bit of feedback on how, what type of information is useful for our audience or the people who use the Civicus Monitor, what else should be be considering to when we implement the system and what type of information is useful and how we should be presenting it. So thank you everyone for the feedback uh, and so on the chat that uh, we might have time for a few questions from the audience if people uh, have them. So I will give uh, a couple of minutes if does anyone have any questions or comments before we close. I see one on the chat. Uh, yeah, we are planning, we're already uh, documenting all of this information. We just haven't presented in our annual report yet. Uh, we are planning to present it in our next report, People Power on the Attack 2022, that uh, uh, launched in March of next year. And it is an ongoing 
uh, initiative. So we are expected to actually gather this data on a daily basis. The same as we're doing it now, which is a little bit more broad, uh, we're expecting to document on a daily basis every time we get a report from our research partner. So hopefully this will be information that is ongoing. So in a decade time, we should be able to have a good 10 years report and more detailed information about uh, city space uh, restrictions. Anyone else would like to make a comment or a question? All right, great. Uh, then, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It was a very uh, useful exercise for us to kind of think through uh, the data that we're collecting and how we're presenting this uh, data, and also to share a bit of what's coming next for the Circus uh, Monitor. Uh, we have a, an address on our website, so we're always open for feedback or any comments that you might have. So feel free, feel free to email us. And I hope you have a, a great session this afternoon and in the next coming days uh, here in the Netherlands and actually based here a little bit farther from The Hague. And hope you have a, a nice time. Uh, thank you, everyone, and apologies for the technical issues that kind of a little bit a bit more of our time, but I think we make the most out of it. Thank you so much, everyone.